and um, we're going to uh, hop into some questions. If you have questions, by all means, feel free to add them in the chat. We're going to go back and forth between some questions in the chat and um, some questions um, that, that I've pre-prepared um, for our panelists. So I'm going to start um, with Isabella. And um, the first question is, in your time sailing, what are some of the barriers that you've observed in the sport related to gender equity and or sexism? Thank you, Andrew. And thank you, everyone, for being here. I'm super honored to be part of this panel with these other amazing ladies um, and excited to share some of my experiences in the past. Like, I mean, I've been sailing half my life and experienced um, all different levels of sailing. Uh, some of the barriers that I've experienced and observed is based on well, based on weight and strength and ability. A lot of times it, women are underestimated. They're assumed that, oh, they can't pull up a spin that quickly. Oh, they're not strong enough to man this boat, this position. Um, they are not, and you can even just hear the language, they're not strong enough to man that position. It's just assumed that because of our body and our physiology, we're not able to do certain things. And so we're often passed over. And that also gives us less opportunity to try those things and to learn from them. Um, so that's one of the bigger barriers that I've observed. Another one is also just not feeling comfortable to fail and to learn through making mistakes. A lot of spaces and yacht clubs just don't feel safe enough to just try something new, such as skippering, for example, or docking a boat or learning how to trailer a boat or craning, for example, all of those things many of which are seen as more masculine or more men just appear to be doing them. They can be quite intimidating to try for the first time because, oh God, what if I accidentally back my boat into another car as I'm slowly trailering out? Or what if I dock badly and people are looking at me? Like all of these thoughts are going through your head and it can often um, prohibit people from even trying or being willing to learn because the fear of messing up and being ridiculed is so high. And I think that's partly to do with the culture that are in a lot of these yacht clubs. It just doesn't feel safe. And that's why a lot of women um, just feel comfortable not trying or get something, getting someone else to do, try, do it for them. Awesome. Thank, thank you for getting started, Isabel, and thank you for adding that. Um, Jen, I, I want would like to pass things over to you. Where are some of the barriers um, that, that you see in the sport as it relates to gender equity and sexism. Yeah, thank you. I think um, I can speak to a few different perspectives. Certainly as an athlete, um, it was consistently um, communicated either directly or indirectly that um, the performance of the women's fleet was not as strong as the men's fleet. I remember um, being told right out with practice races in the 470 fleet uh, that the men's fleet just wouldn't allow us to race with them because we weren't as good. So we would have to run separate starts. And that was in 2011 uh, and 2012 that that was happening. I'm, it's a mixed fleet now, but I'm, I'm sure those issues persist. Um, from a, a coaching point of view, I certainly f remember looking around at my career prospects and thinking, well, I'm never going to be a, a national team coach. There are no national team coaches who are women. There are no um, leaders at the NSO level. Uh, there were at that time at the PSO level, but not at the NSO level. Therefore, if I want my career to progress, I will either need to look at a different sport entirely or at a different profession. So I never even made it into the senior leadership roles within the sport of sailing because I just didn't feel that that was even worth pursuing. And if it did, it would be a massive uphill climb. So um, went and worked in rugby instead, which you wouldn't think would be less, uh, or would be more, more welcoming to women. But I mean, I did make it into those senior leadership positions. Awesome. I, I think some of, the, some of the barriers that we see, we see, we see them uh, across sport. Thank you for sh sharing, Jen. And last, but certainly not least for this question, Wendy, um, what are some of the barriers um, that you've observed in your time in this sport? Well, certainly when, excuse me, when I got my keelboat and started racing it, uh, the disrespect that was shown because at that time, there were not many women 
skippers, women helms people. And and so I certainly experienced disrespect on the race course. Uh, people felt they could just do whatever they want and disobey the rules and and push me out of the way sort of thing. And and I learned quickly to take them to the room or otherwise I would never gain their respect. I think also, and, and this is a really sad thing for me to say, but last year um, I learned of several incidents of bullying, particularly in the Club 420 fleet, where um, all male crews would bully the um, the either the mixed crews, especially if the if the uh, female was on the helm, uh, and especially the 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 all female crews, and that is a real concern. What's the bigger concern about that is that the 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 girls are afraid to come forward and um and and i learned from their mothers that they want to leave the sport because of the bullying and i think that's that's a really sad statement on on our younger people i, I would have hoped that by now um 16 and 17 year old boys would would have learned to respect uh their fellow sailors in terms of the officials i know uh it's if you if you look at the statistics the number of female officials in this country is very very small um and a statistic from world sailing that are about 30 percent of the sailors globally are, are female and only about 15 percent of the officials are female so you know, you most of our committees are male dominated and they seem to think that they can apply any kind of um, criteria to keep women out of succeeding as officials. Oh, that's sad, but hopefully we, um, we, we see some of those numbers increase over time, especially with having conversations like the one tonight. Um. Isabel, I want to start with you with the next question because I, I know that um you've had um some experience um um with the um you with you sailing, but how in your opinion how can sailing communities actively address um the alarm and dropout rates of young girls um in particular ages eleven to sixteen that we're seeing in the sport? Um, before I start this question, I want to shout out Marjolyn, who's on the call, um, because there was a lot of research done with her and some other women behind the scenes to gather data, and they discovered this statistic, um, which, and I cannot quote it, I wish I could, maybe Marjolyn, you could pop it in the chat, but most girls drop out of sailing between 11 to 14 or 11 to 16, and as you said, at, at an alarming rate. I started sailing competitively at 14 and between the age of 14 to 18, I probably considered quitting at least 10 times. And it was from a variety of reasons uh, from I'm not heavy and strong enough for this laser. And no matter how hard I try, I just cannot perform at the same level of all these other boys that I'm competing against uh, to I'm actually low-key traumatized by some of these high wind scenarios I'm finding myself in to other reasons of I'm on start lines with boys who are literally bullying me out of the way. And if I do not know my rules or if I don't start banging my tailor on the deck, I'm not, I'm going to get pushed out the way and I'm not going to have a good start and suddenly my whole race is gone. So I, there were so many different reasons over the years that almost pushed me to that point of quitting, looking around and seeing my all male laser race team. That was all male for at least the three to four years that I was there, seeing girls come in and immediately leave. Um, surprising myself. I'm like, why am I still here? <laughs> and honestly, the reason I stayed, I have to credit to my mother. She, every time I'd be like, I don't want to do this anymore. She would remind me of why I love sailing and my passion for it. And part of the reason why I've stayed so long now into my twenties is that I also redirected my passion towards keelboat racing, towards coaching. I'm now looking at being like race officials and judging and I've discovered that sailing is a lifetime sport. It's something that I'm now committed to for the rest of my life, but I almost didn't get there. And I know there are so many girls who get to that point and they might not have a strong figure to, con to encourage them to stay in the sport or to have that motivation. So how I think that we can start to address this, I think there's so many different ways and no one way is the right way, but 
I think having some more targeted um, either camps or, for example, like what we did at the Girls in Sailing Camp in Toronto, um, that was really special because you could just feel in the atmosphere this was a safe space. And it wasn't about getting all the girls who were super into racing. It was just getting a bunch of girls together to learn about sailing and to learn how they can connect with each other and just make sailing besties because I didn't have any female uh, I didn't have any female sailing friends and when I found some female sailing friends I would they would often leave within a year or two and that was really hard for me because I think I would have done a lot better in terms of competition and performance if I had been in a double-handed boat and we see that so much with girls in sailing often they we're, we're more social and we really appreciate racing in 420s as Wendy said 29ers 49ers because there is that more of a camaraderie you have a partner um, but the problem with some of those boats is they're they can be expensive it's hard to find a crew who's committed and if there are no other girls around you then who are you going to sail with so I definitely would have gone into a 29 if there were more girls around me at that time. But instead I stayed in, in lasers, which are more male dominated and are a lot more intimidating. And thankfully I didn't quit, but um, it, you almost you get to that point. So having girls in sailing camps to connect girls with each other. And I know out of that sailing camp, there was a ton of girls who came out and said, we're going to race in 420s together. I found my crew or I found my perfect skipper or a bunch of girls who are like, we really love doing this together. We're going to keep coming back every summer for camps. Um, we might not go racing, but you know, this might be something maybe we do a cruising course later in life. I don't know. Or we get some girl gathers and female only regattas. Um, or we set up coaching pathways because again, there's not just one pathway through sailing and have some female only coaching clinics just, and like, again, creating female-only spaces, these are just stopgap measures, but they at least create a safe space to bring people into this sport. And then once they're there, they can build up more confidence in these safer spaces to then go out into the other parts. Because the reality is, is that we can't keep the gender separate forever, and we don't want to. I've learned so much from my male counterparts. I've had amazing male coaches. There's so much I've learned from them. But I really to get into the sport and to, you know, have that initial hook or realization of why I love it so much. I think we do need these female only spaces. And then actually on the flip side, having some more targeted training for boys, because it's often always on the women, but I think that there needs to be some accountability for behavior and for culture. Otherwise it's just going to keep reproducing and the boys are looking at the men above them and looking at that behavior above them. So actually having gender conversations with boys and saying hey have you ever thought about like what are some stereotypes you hear about and not just about girls but about boys too because there, I'm sure there are many harmful stereotypes that have impacted boys oh you're too skinny you're not heavy enough for the laser you have to stay in radials you can't go up to full rig oh why are you not strong enough you should be going to the gym all the time like why can't you pull up that spinnaker and I'm sure they can be just as harmful for those boys as it can be for girls so having those honest conversations separate at first and then together is the only way forward because there needs to be some more understanding of the <laughs> the repercussions of language like that and that's that's what leads to this bigger culture and these bigger issues as well as myths and assumptions <laughs> of these stereotypes awesome thank you so much about that isabel you, you brought up so many um great points up but one per point i do want to highlight especially with um, International Women's Day being on um, Friday, I think it's important um, for the men in the call, and I'm also speaking um, to myself, that it's not up to um, women and girls to um, solve or cor correct the, um, the, the problems that they face. Um, we as um, men need to um, play a role in that and look inwards to um, what we can do individually and what we can do um, collectively to um, get to a place where um, these issues no longer exists or are no longer able to thrive. So thank you um, for bringing that up, Isabella. Um, Wendy or, or Jen, I'll, I'll leave it um, to either of you. Was there anything else that, um, that you um, want to add when we talk about young girls dropping out of um, sailing? Well, as Isabella said, 
girls are dropping out at an alarming rate, but in fact, so are boys. And um, and it, it she's made a good point that the smaller boys, it's sometimes hard for them because the equipment demands a certain weight. So um, I think the optim optimum weight for a laser is is something like 185 pounds and um and there are and not everyone is is six foot tall and 185 pounds um so so part of it is equipment driven and i and i agree that if we could if we could somehow encourage our youth sailors to get involved in keelboat sailing and if you look at the small keelboats there are a lot of women in those fleets and they encourage each other and i really think that that's you know, one positive way we could try to keep girls in the sport, get them get them interested in crewing. I know I I always had someone from the the junior program doing four deck on my boat, and um and and they they all became passionate keel boat sailors to this day. So giving them an opportunity really really helps, I think. Awesome. Thank, thank you for that, Wendy. Um, moving on to another question, but Jen, I'm going to start, start with you and feel free to add in if there's anything else you want to add there. But um, in your opinion, um, what, are some, what are some ways that the sailing community can create a more inclusive and enjoyable um, environment, not only for, for young girls, but women across the board, which in turn would benefit the entire sailing community? Yeah, thank you. Um, I... Uh, I, I might be taking what uh, what Wendy and Isabella to have said and actually flipping it a little bit on its head um, with another lens, which is, are there opportunities for women as they age out of the youth classes to stay in dinghies? As a, a female sailor, I didn't want to race on keel boats when I turned 18, 19 years old. I didn't want to be with a bunch of middle-aged men on keelboats who were going to make me sit on the rail and then pass me a beer. I just felt deeply uncomfortable with that. I would have been much happier uh, staying in my dinghy and being an adult dinghy racer. It's a different culture. It's a different environment. I also think um, the scheduling of racing was designed a long time ago when it was even more male dominated than it is now. Wednesday night racing, for example, happens over the dinner hour. It happens when you're putting kids to bed. Who's going to be the one who stays home to do that? It will be the mom. It will be the wife. It will be the woman. Uh, so can we look at simple designs and schedules that inherently remove those barriers for women to stay in the sport. I think it's particularly um, a, a particularly missed opportunity when our coaches become mothers. Uh, they leave, they go on mat leave, they have this little human. It's very difficult for them to go on the water for eight hours without their little human. So they, they miss huge tracks of the season and then they don't have access to the same opportunities because there's this attitude of, oh, well, you're not up to date. You know, things have progressed or, you know, you've been you've been off doing motherhood things. So you don't know what the new class rules are. You don't know what the new this is or the new that is. And those women who took a long time to build as coaches, they feel somewhat relegated. They feel somewhat uh, washed up and they just leave. They don't re-engage in the sport. Yeah, and th th those are such great points. I I, I think it's important that I, we we reimagine the way we, that we offer sailing um not only at the club level but um in, including going up to to provincial and otherwise. Um, Wendy, was there anything else um that that you that you want to add there? Well, when when Jennifer was talking about staying in dinghies, I was reminded of uh, an event we had at our club last year at, at Ashbridge's Bay Yacht Club. We hosted um, the Great Lakes Laser Masters Championship, and uh, it became known to us as the Grumpy Old Men's Regatta. And 
all of the rules that they've set up in the in the laser ilka class for masters are are driven by men so they and there were in fact only two women who signed up myself and and another woman from our club who is actually the mother of a former national team member uh, we were the only females at the regatta and neither one of us will ever do it again and it was just the worst possible experience. They won't. They won't acknowledge that women do not want to sail full rig uh, boats anymore. And it's just. And I know that Judy Luger won a world championship in her full rig laser, but times have changed, and most of us just we we want to use the radio. And th that's not something that they're, they are encouraging at all. I mean, you've got to be a big, strong, tough guy and sail the full rig. And if it's really, really windy, well, the wimps will go down to the, the, the can swap down to the radio. Unacceptable in 2023. Awesome. Or tw I think it was 2022, actually. So, yeah, just not, not acceptable. Thank you, Wendy. Isabel, I, I see you see you nodding your head um a lot. Is there anything that you'd like you like to add or agree with? Um yeah, I definitely agree with the lasers. The lasers feel like the the worst old boys club. And it doesn't if you're in the full rig, it's an old boys club and a grumpy old men club. If you're in the radial, it's a bunch of teenage boys chirping at you, which is just giving you excuse my language, a lot of shit. <laughs> and it I've seen some fantastic national team laser sailors like Isabella Bertold and Moira racing in Vancouver. And as a 16 year old, I was in awe of them. Like these amazing female sailors are in my fleet in radial. And all these 16 year old boys are so disrespectful to them. Didn't like, we're just constantly pushing them out the way and just didn't like, again, it's just like they were stuck in a fleet of 16 year old boys because as soon as they got big enough or old enough, they're immediately going up to the full rig. So that, that's my comment for the laser class. I think there's a lot of work that can be done um, on that class because there's just some toxicity there and it definitely is around starts and it's around the age and the weight. Um, but I want to also go back to the comment about going out into keel boats with middle-aged men who hand you beers and expect you to be real meat because that was that was an experience. And I think we should talk about the different, the other layer um, of sexism in yacht clubs, which is older men and inappropriate comments and inappropriate alcohol use. And we know there's the there's a saying that, oh, all sailors are like low-key alcoholics. And there's just there's a ton of drinking. And at yacht clubs, it is a part of the culture. After you finish Wednesday evening racing, you go get a beer. After you finish lunchtime racing, you go get a beer. And there's just this huge drinking culture that has led a lot of people to feel like it's not that safe because I don't know many people, but I personally don't feel that safe around a bunch of drunk men. Um, and when I was 18, I would was literally trained or taught by some of the older women who I'd race in keelboats with to cover my wine glass or my beer glass because it would just be constantly topped up without me noticing. And I'm 18, 19. I am thinking, wow, this is great. I'm getting a lot of free booze. But there is just certain realities there that that's that's not that's not comfortable. It's not that safe. Um, and I sure I was invited on to keelboats a lot, but I was probably just seen as like, oh, a pretty young woman who's you know hopping on a keelboat. Does she know what she's doing? Maybe I'll let her do a couple things. And it's even worse if you're like my mother, who's middle aged, coming on these boats and you know willing to learn and willing to try different things. Oh no, go sit up the front or go do backstays. Like you have no say in the middle of the pit. So it's, yeah, the bigger keel boats, it's really hard to break into them, to learn from them. I think the small keel boat fleets are a ton of fun. Um, I saw one of the comments talking about J80s. I think J70s, there's a ton of women popping into those. You, um, Knowledge is 24s as well. I just got a VX1 and that is a super exciting new fleet that's growing. And my mom and I own that together and we co-skipper that together. Um, and again, these boats have lighter loads. They're easier to skip it. They're easier to handle. It's about making not like the equipment more accessible to women as well. We don't have to prove ourselves by pulling up this massive spinnaker and grinding away at, you know, sh um, our sheeting 
we can also just get boats that have lighter loads and are easier and more fun to sail um, and make those the more commonly seen classes. We don't have to be stuck with these old design boats that were designed by men for men. Um, so I, I agree. I think that Cubos, you can learn a ton from them. I love seeing juniors get out on Cubos. We're trying to get as many juniors as we can out in our VX1. I think that there's a lot of things that you can learn in terms of tactics and strategy and reading the wind that you can't always get when you're in a dinghy, but vice versa. There's a lot of things that you can learn in a dinghy. And one of the biggest things that we've been trying to do at our yacht club is set up an adult program and in dinghies. Because there's a lot of people like my mom who was in dinghies when she was 16, but her now her only option for sailing is in these keel boats. And so all she wanted to do is go out on my laser. And so we just set up a program for that. And we've had so many people come through and we've tried to set up a female only version somewhat unsuccessfully. We're hoping to get um, that it will catch on this year, but I can say Royal Victoria Yacht Club have an amazing program called Salty Sisters for women to come out in, I believe it's either 420s or a double-handed boat, and it's a fantastic program, and they've been incredibly successful and made an amazing community over there. So I think it's not just about, okay, let's get women out in keel boats. It's also how can we keep women in dinghies and not just racing, but just going out on a Sunday and having a great time you know, going a couple courses, maybe learning some race techniques or whatnot, and then having a lunch afterwards. And the lunch or the part afterwards doesn't also have to revolve around drinking. <laughs> there could be a latte culture that we try and create at these yacht clubs. It doesn't always have to be a drinking culture. Like how hard could it be to get an espresso machine in our yacht club? Apparently quite hard because we still do not have one at West Vancouver Yacht Club. Like, can you imagine? Like you get off the water and you have a coffee. And we normalize that. And that's the social aspect, not having a pitcher of beer at 11 a.m. Anyway, all different thoughts, but. No, and, and, and those are great thoughts. And actually that's, that's part, I, I do want to get back to um, that in a little bit. Um, with that said, um, we had a couple of questions um, in the um, chat around coaching. And um, I have a couple of questions um, specifically around coaching so um jen i'll start with you on this one actually we'll, we'll open up whoever wants to start can but um how can sailing organizations actively promote and support the recruitment and retention of female coaches and role models i'll just throw it out there whoever wants to start by all means feel free to do so i, I want to just jump in here with my tcac hat on uh and because the coaches group has made or instructors group, I guess, has made a significant change in their requirements. And they're really trying to encourage women to come back in after they've um, had a family or, or had a child. And it used to be there were lots of barriers. They'd have to go back and basically retrain. And now they don't. They just they can come in at the same level that they left at. So I just wanted to to pitch that as one positive change that's come about in the last couple of months, actually. Awesome. Thank you for that, Wendy. So going back to um as we dive into um Supporting growing um, female coaches and, and role models. Um, what do we think um, can be important in terms of some strategies to increase that? I think that, um, I think it starts with keeping women in the sport in the first place. So it we all know it's more expensive to recruit. It's more expensive to onboard. It's more expensive to... Uh, train a new employee. So let's look at why women are leaving sport. I mean, the low hanging fruit is ask them. Everyone's going to leave for a different reason, right? Uh, that being said, attrition of female coaches happens to a large extent as they enter those family years. So, you know, what are what are other organizations doing to keep those people? Are they, are they, you know, maintaining their jobs? Are they creating um, HR policies that have, you know, top ups or, or making it such that they can travel, that type of thing? You know, can we be progressive as a sport? Can we look at how we keep parents? And that's actually not going to impact just female coaches. It will impact all parents of young families. 
And it's really important to encourage both new mothers and new fathers to do that type of thing, because that's how you will really achieve that equity within an organization and within a workforce is having both genders taking advantage and experiencing those parental opportunities and then moving up into senior leadership positions where they can then improve policies, improve organization, improve scheduling, uh, improve staffing, all those really tedious uh, governance and policy pieces that ultimately were designed before we had a lot of women in sport. Well, thank you for that, Jen. Um, just an important piece that you brought, especially towards the beginning there, when we're talking about asking, like whether um we're, we're trying to attract more women and girls, whether it's we're trying to attract a specific underrepresented community, I, I think asking questions and gaining feedback is important because no um no one person represents an entire group. And we also have to remember um, no group is a monolith either. So no group is, is the same, if you will. So asking questions, um, getting feedback, and then using said feedback to improve our programs is absolutely important. So thank you for bringing it up. Um, Je Je um, Isabella or Wendy, was there anything else um, that you want to add to that? Um, maybe just a quick point about um, losing coaches. I think the the young family years is a key one, but also the years that I'm in right now. I used to coach full-time every summer between university. I'm now in a full-time job. Um, and that transition to a nine to five, I have not been able to keep coaching. The most I could do last summer was I would coach um, every Sunday an adult program for three to four hours. And even then that was really hard. I'm st I'm still getting used to the nine to five life um, and juggling all of that, but it is really hard to find coaches beyond those university, like high school university years. The majority of our coaches in our learn to sail programs are in that age gap. And when they graduate university and enter the real world <laughs> of jobs and responsibilities, like in that gap before, you know, having young families, it's it's really hard. I would love to coach a race team. I would love to coach more, but I also am set by my own company of how many hours I can work outside of my nine to five, um, let alone what I can work without burning myself out. So it's really, it's tough because I also can't just go in the summer. Okay. I'm going to switch off my nine to five and go back to full-time coaching. Like I can't do that anymore. So I'm not sure what the solution is there. Maybe it's more careers for coaches and for women. Cause maybe if I saw some more full-time opportunities beyond university, I would have taken them, but I didn't. So I went this other way, but, um, or maybe just more flexibility again with the scheduling. Um, I don't know, but it's it just it's another spot where we are losing women. Jen, go ahead. I think another really key piece to look at is the remuneration. So if one were to look at the fleets and the ages that many female coaches gravitate to, it's not always, but often opties, uh, younger age groups, which tend to be paid less. So we can't keep people in those positions because they're not living wages. When in reality, those are the most important fleets that we have because they feed all the way up through the system. Really, if you look, I mean, I'm an accountant, so I look at everything through a financial lens. That's the bread and butter of what we do. That actually funds the system. So why are we paying those positions lower in terms of salaries than perhaps the five, six, the comp dev, you know, those other positions. I think that's a, a really important piece to look at. I think they're seen as less skilled, which is crazy because if you've tried to teach opties or those that age kids how to sail and how to race, that is incredibly difficult. It's, it's extremely so difficult. difficult. <laughs> and it's a different skill set, but it's often passed up to women because they're seen as more nurturing and more motherly. And there's a 16 year old girl that I'm being like told, like heard these things, like told these things. Um, that's a whole other issue with gender norms too. Like, why are we teaching 
those sort of courses and not allowed to teach the higher level race team courses as well. But both are equally as important. And I agree that, that the younger kids, that is the foundation, that's the feeding point to the sport. Fantastic. Thank you both. Um, I encourage you to keep adding questions into the chat. Um, there's um, definitely some great conversation going on. Um, just want to um, highlight um, what Kim was saying and open it up to the floor. If there's um, any thoughts, um, it says um, in Europe, it seems like the Opti fleets and ILCA fleets are split into male and female fleets. I've not seen this in America, including the Sail Canada Youth Championships. Would that help? It, it would probably help. The problem is that, so we we have in, in Canada, we have a problem. We have a very large geography. We don't have a lot of sailors within that geography. Um, for uh, most of our events turn out to be regional because of the travel involved. And in Europe, you know, most of Europe would fit into Southern Ontario. So they get more opportunities and sailing is a bigger sport in Europe than it is here. So that's one of the problems. Um, and it's, it's not a problem easily solved. I don't think we see it on the officiating side, which we haven't really talked about, but in Europe, there are a lot of very young judges, a lot of very young race officers we don't have them here. We're, most of our judges in particular are close to my age or my age. And um and whereas in Europe they're 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 they're, they're there's a young woman from Poland, for example, who's 21 years old and is an international judge. Absolutely unheard of here. But she has more opportunities because it's really easy to get to an, a third country. Uh, to be to be a third country in Europe without it being expensive, whereas here we can get opportunities in Canada and the U.S., but getting that third country is very difficult. So part of it's geography, um, and and there just maybe aren't the numbers. I think there probably are in the Opti class, um, in the Ilka. Hard to say. I know when I was at the uh, Radio Youth Worlds in 2015, there were three male fleets and one female fleet. So when you've only got two fleets, uh, you might not have enough for, for a women's only or a female only fleet. I don't know. What do you think, Isabella? I don't know. I, I really like Tina's comments in the chats, though, that I think Ilka creating women that only fleets and male only fleets will be a huge step in making that fleet less toxic to be honest and there are some benefits to it too like as Tina said like four days of the women racing and then you switch over that you can share boats there's less cost with that um or you do like two different weekends like I don't know I think it's so hard because Europe just has the people and it has the demand and can Canada there's I don't know especially in, um like Ontario has um, some solid numbers but BC doesn't really and then the other provinces I don't I don't know too much about but it's hard to get that consistently applied across the country when the numbers are so different like between yacht clubs um, and we were lucky enough enough now that we the laser team that I was a part of uh, eight years ago that was only like me, me being the only girl now is 50 50 and that's incredible to see so they probably could do that but I know they're one of the few clubs and race teams that are like that. So I don't know. I don't have an, a solid answer to that. But it's, it's. I think it's just tough in Canada in general. Perfect. Thank you for that, Isabella. Um, I just want to um just go back, if you will, um, just quickly. Actually, not quickly. Doesn't matter. But um, Wendy, um, two two officials. I I want to um put that question to you, and then I went to the to the chat. Um, but when we talk about looking at this from an officiating perspective, um, what are some of the things in, in your opinion that we can do to actively promote and support the recruitment of female officials within the sport? 
Well, and part of it is keeping, it, it's just like the coaching side. It's keeping women in the sport. You have to be a, a sailor, a racing sailor in order to be a judge for sure. And it's also preferred. I mean, if you're going to move up sort of beyond the lowest levels in, in race management, um, same thing, you have to be an active racer. Um, so when they drop out of the sport, it becomes more difficult to encourage them to to keep going. And also, you know, I I hate to say this, but I, I feel the need to. There are, particularly on the race management side, there are problems with the gatekeeping, with um with not wanting women to advance, with a feeling that they don't get as many opportunities, which they don't. Truthfully, they don't, in on the race management side, they don't get as many opportunities to go places and, and, and to go to other countries and go to events outside the area the way judges do. And so there's, um, so there's a tremendous amount of gatekeeping, particularly on that side of the officiating. On the, on the judging side, it's 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 much better um but we're lucky right now we have a, a a really good group of people that are on the judges subcommittee and uh i think it's about a 50 50 split of women which is impressive um given how few female judges there are so I, I, there's no easy answer to the question. As long as there are more men in the higher positions in officiating, they're going. They they can be the gate, gatekeepers, and I don't. I I don't have an easy solution to that problem. No, that that that's fair. Thank you for that, Wendy. And actually, um, that's um a good segue into um next piece, including um some of the conversation that's happening in the chat, because I do want to get into talking about um the culture within the sport. Um, as I was doing um, some research um, in, in preparation for this, I the one thing that became very clear to me very quickly um, was address, in order to address gender equity and sexism, um, we, we need to talk aloud, if you will, about um, some of the cultural issues that exist within the sport. So I'm gonna throw this question out there um, feel free, um, any of you to um, run with it, but what strategies can be employed to um, dismantle sexist culture um, within sailing organizations and communities? I think the first thing is that women and girls have to stand up and, and challenge. And I think it's unfortunate that the girls that were um, bullied last summer, that they they were a they were so bullied they wouldn't come forward. And we can't stop it unless we know who's doing the bullying and then we can deal with it. Um, so that's that's part of the problem. Um, there's, unfortunately, I, I, I wish I had better ideas, but I, I, I do think I do, I do wish if girls are being bullied, they would stand up and say, I'm, I can't keep sailing because of this person behaving this way. And let us know who it is. Of course, thank you for that. Isabella, not to put you on the spot, but um, you started to um, talk about this a couple of questions ago. So I just sort of wanted to um, give you the opportunity to um, even um, address that a little bit further as you talk about the culture on the thing you support. Yeah, so I'll, I think some of the things I said earlier definitely apply to this question. I think it's education for men. Um, it's having, we had a an open round table discussion at the Girls in Sailing Camp that has honestly stuck with me to this day where we talked about gender stereotypes. Like, have you thought of a time where someone said something and it just stuck with you? And it's like, oh, girls are not strong enough to pull their boats on, up, like their legs up onto the dock and onto their dolly or they're not strong enough to pull their dolly up the beach. Um, why, why is that stereo, where's that stereotype coming from? And just having open conversations about gender stereotypes and how that is informing our culture and how that is informing how we approach activities, that having that with both men and women, I think is really important and actually encouraging your clubs to have 
like bring it into the open and not just be sidelined to maybe like a DEI committee, which I would hope most of yacht clubs have, but I know that our yacht club didn't have that until more, more recently when there was a more push to actually establish that. And now we do have a DEI committee, but yet there's not too many actions coming out of it because it's almost now been siloed and, oh, that's just the box has been ticked for a DEI, but you know, we don't actually have to see any more wider change across the community. Um, so I think education and just open conversations about gender and just some of the language too. Um, I studied women and gender studies. I did that a course in my first year of university. And there's a lot of language around gender, which I'm sure Andrew talked about in the first course that a lot of people are not familiar with, even just basic distinctions between gender and sex um, and understanding what transgender means, what cisgender means, um, pronouns, when it is, um, you know, making a safe space for people to share their pronouns, talking about the LGBTQ community as well. Um, so creating all like all of these this language like intersectionality for example things like that they're not as widely known and we cannot assume that everyone knows this but i think maybe education courses starting at the boards because i completely agree with marjolin that it, it does need to come from leadership and if the boards of yacht clubs don't understand basic gender terminology or how there, the structure of our yacht club has been entrenched and built in sexist and patriarchal structures, then how can any change come from that? Um, I know Judy had mentioned, um, she's, and unfortunately wasn't able to be on this panel today, but when we had a call, she said that her yacht club's one of the oldest in Canada, 175 years old, I want to say, and there's only been two female Commodores. Same with West Vancouver Yacht Club, only two female Commodores in 75 years. Um, how how does that happen? If there's if women can't look up to the committees and see that there's leadership in those committees, then like it's there needs to be top down as well because grassroots can only go so far. Um, so I think yeah, education for every board at yacht clubs and having a basic gender seminar and hearing experiences and stories, and then maybe opening it up to the wider yacht club community to come learn about this and then putting it in the race team and having these frank conversations about stereotypes, myths, assumptions. That's a great way to tackle culture. I think the other piece is the latte culture, not the bar culture, espresso machines at yacht clubs, because then maybe women with their kids, like they can stop by um, and, have a coffee as opposed to coming to have a beer um like that it's just a simple so simple to have something like that but it does make the space more accessible and it changes the way that the space is used and how people socialize uh and then mm, i think there's just lastly would be actually showing clear pathways whether to high level coaching careers whether to boards like I've just joined a committee now, my yacht club, but if it wasn't for other strong female leaders on that committee, I don't think I would have joined it. Um, so it's being offered those opportunities, seeing that pathway and that people have, like women need to, um, have paved the way before me, for sure. Like I'm entering into positions that have been made through another female. And it is incredibly hard when you look ahead of you and see that there are no other females there. And when I did the judging course, um, Katie and Dale King, like they to see female judges leading this amazing course, like that, for me, that's a pathway. I can see it. I can see myself potentially going there. Um, so it's it's a whole variety of things, um, but obviously um, those are just my initial thoughts. I think there's a lot more we can do though. Awesome, thank, thank you for that, Isabella. And, and it just takes one one of those things, you give a long list of things, but it just takes one of those things to create that ripple impact to um, create better spaces and places. Just before I pass um, over to Jen with um, the same question, I, I just want to um, quickly um, address the um, the chat because it's um, Marilyn and I apologize if I pronounced that name wrong. And um, Sophia brought up some great um, points, and, and I think that goes around um, to allyship. And I said it before, but um, I'll I'll say it again. Um, without having men, or in some cases, young boys speak up and step up and act as allies, a lot of this conversation that we're having just simply isn't going to happen. And when we look at allyship, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more um, with our final presentation um, that's coming up in a couple of weeks, but allyship isn't easy and nor is it supposed to be easy. It's supposed to be uncomfortable because if it's comfortable, it means either A, 
there's more that um we can do as men or be what you're doing is performative, which is just a big word for saying it's making yourself look good. So I to that point, I, I think it's important um again for us as um men to um look inward as allies. If we truly want to be allies, how are we going to step outside of our comfort zone to create um better spaces and places for women and girls? So, um, and also I, I like the word accomplish it, but again, I promise that I wasn't going to talk at you for two hours. Thank you for bringing that up, Kate. Um, I do want to um, bring it back though, and um, um, leave some space um, for, for um, Jen to be able to answer that question around um, the, the culture piece around sexism. Yeah, thank you. I think that um, it's not up to women to have to stand up for themselves. That is a piece of the puzzle, but it's not our responsibility. Um, I think a huge piece of changing that culture is, as Isabella said, to put women in leadership roles, in decision-making roles. So many decisions within sailing and beyond sailing were made at a time when women were not decision-makers. Once women are equally represented on boards, are equally represented in management roles, the decisions will have an equal evaluation of needs between the genders. So, you know, the, they will inherently become more equitable because you've got a broader scope, a broader life experience, a broader group of people being able to make those decisions. So having, I love the fact that Sport Canada has a, uh, they've come out with their uh, governance code and they say you have to have gender equity on your board. I think that's amazing. If we had clubs, PSAs uh, that could also achieve the same thing, I, I think that we would naturally start to uh, change the culture because of the general presence of women on those boards and in those leadership roles. I think that it would go a really long way to um, shaping the sport. That's such a great point that you bring up, Jen, and thank you for that. Um, when we talk about making sport more inclusive, um, whether it's um, for women and girls, whether it's for um, African Canadians, Indigenous folks, et cetera, et cetera, I think one of the things that we have to remember, and this is not unique to Salem, by the way, I just had this conversation um, with another sport um, just last week, but we have to remember that sport was never designed to um, be um, inclusive for everyone. And that doesn't necessarily mean that sport is inherently racist or um, sexist or um, anything necessarily discriminatory or negative, but it means that we have to put in the work in order to create spaces and places where not only everybody can show up and be their true and authentic self, but at the end of the day, it comes back to safety. If a young girl or a woman, no matter what her age is, can't show up and feels the need to code switch or feels the need to sit um, in the shadows, if you will, and can't participate, that's now an issue of safety, psychological safety. It's not the same as a concussion, if you will, but safety nonetheless. So like when we talk about um, some of these things that we're talking about tonight, we're talking about creating safer spaces for everyone. So thank you, Jen, Jen for bringing that piece up. Um, so many, we, we have a few questions left here. Again, I encourage you to, um, lots of great conversation happening in chat. I encourage you to throw your questions in there as well. But um, I, let's start, um, let's go to this next question here. Um, one of the things that um, you had mentioned, Isabel, and I'll throw it to anybody, um, but um, talked about um, women trying um, new things without the fear of failure or judgment. Um, so how can sailing um, clubs and spaces and places be made more welcoming for women to try new things without fear of failure or judgment, similar to those um, that may have been provided for men? Um. I love this question because my mom has this saying, and I swear I've used it in so many aspects of my life. Um, my mom's also the reason I'm here on this panel. She's been pushing for DEI for ages and she's amazing. She can't be on participating today because she just flew back from somewhere, but she is also my female sailing role model and reason why I'm still here. But she always says, 
life for men and women are just like on a golf course. Uh, women and men will hit their ball. Women will go look for their ball 50 feet behind where it landed. Men will go look for their ball 50 feet ahead of where it landed. We're trained from such a young age to underestimate how well we're going to do things. And if we start saying, oh, I actually think I'm quite good at this, we're seen as bragging and full of ourselves. Whereas if a guy does that, oh, they're really, they're advocating for themselves and they're and they're really good at what they do. It's 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 part of a language and we see it everywhere. And it's not just in sailing and it's not just in sport, but it often comes to a head here. And I think as women, we are really hard on ourselves. And I just, I even feel that in as simple of a game as like pool, you're playing at a bar and you miss it. A guy would be like, oh, whatever. Like, you know, like I normally play really well, haha. But then a girl's like, oh my God, I can't believe I did that. That's so embarrassing. Like it's horrible either. Like I'm really annoyed at myself and it's uncomfortable. And I still feel like that to this day. And I know I'm sure other people maybe feel the same. It's it's uncomfortable trying new things and feeling judged. And I just think that there's just a clear gender discrepancy there. And I definitely comes from our culture and how we are socialized because it's hard to fail. And yet we learn so much from making mistakes and so much of sailing is learning from making mistakes. I don't, I think sailing is such a unique sport because every time we go out, if something will break or could break, it's going to. <laughs> I've had the craziest breaks on my boat or the craziest disasters. And the reality is, is that every time we go out sailing, you never know what's going to happen. And it's being able to have the resiliency and the grit to go, okay, whatever is thrown at me, I can take this on that allows us to grow and why I particularly love sailing because it's helped me grow um, as a person and I think everyone should have that opportunity to learn from that and to learn from the constantly changing conditions of this sport whether it's the equipment or literally just the weather Um, so I think to create these spaces to encourage girls to get comfortable with failing and making mistakes and having a mask fall down or (laughs) having something that they need to screw back together because boys are encouraged to take things apart and put them together. Girls are encouraged to, oh, if you break something, you have to clean it up and you should be ashamed of the fact that you broke it. So how can we encourage girls to be comfortable messing around with things and putting things back together and being okay with things breaking and going wrong because it's always going to go wrong in our sport. I think it will start with women only training courses or women only sessions because uh, to it, it, there's just something about being in a women only space that immediately puts people at ease. They feel less judged. They feel like that's that they have to perform. Or for me, it was always having to prove that I'm good enough to be here, that I am worthy enough to be here in this all male space. And as soon as you take that performative aspect away, oh, suddenly I can actually relax and focus on what I'm doing and try different things. So it's really prioritizing more of a growth mindset as opposed to a fixed mindset of I try once, I failed, I won't try again. Um, So I think it is actually creating those women on these spaces at the beginning, those girls in sailing camps, those girl regattas, um, those, you know, only female race management courses or whatnot, or only female coaching clinics, just creating those spaces and encouraging women to get comfortable with failing that that's going to be a huge mindset because often one of the things holding women back are ourselves. We don't, we pull ourselves out of the race before it even begins. And I have self-sabotaged for years with my performance and, oh, there's an easy excuse why I didn't perform well in that race. I'm not strong enough or I'm a girl like that's It's expected of me. No, I could have performed really well in that race and I trained hard for it. At the end of the day, it was my own mental performance that pulled me out. So I think the mindset is a really huge part of it. Um, and it's creating those safe female only spaces to begin with as like the first measure that can maybe lead to a shift in it. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for that, Isabel. And, and, and so eloquently put, and I've I've had the pleasure of, of meeting meeting your mother ever ever so briefly, but um meeting her and um she's a fantastic person. And I'm 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 glad to see that the apple doesn't fall all far from the tree, if you will. Um, Wendy or um, Jen, um, same question, or is there anything you, you'd like to add to that? Um, 
Sorry, I've just got staff in the background uh, chattering away. So Wendy, I'll, I'll let you take this one. No, I'm not going to make a comment. No, that's that's totally fair. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, next question. We we talked about this a little bit, and um, what well, I'll I'll throw it back out there so we can address a little bit further. But um, how can sailing organizations better support um mothers who wish to continue their involvement in the sport while balancing family responsibilities? So we talked about this as 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 being a barrier, but when we look at solutions, like what are some of the solutions? Um, to 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 address some of these barriers that we can talk about. I, I think the sport has to change its mindset. So if I look at the local Toronto or GTA scene and keelboat racing, I'm just going to talk about keelboat racing. It's structured from, it, I don't know for how far back it was structured, but it, it was structured clearly by men who at that point didn't have to be home helping to raise the family. Uh, and they they figured they could go off all weekend and race on sailboats and leave their family, leave their wife at home and have a great time. And the times have changed and they're, that's not acceptable anymore socially, but yet the sport itself hasn't changed. And uh, we're still seeing it that 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 many of the races are structured so that they race all weekend. And uh, look at a series in in the on Lake Ontario, the Lyra series, and and why it's it's foundering. And it's foundering because people can't take a week away from their families. They can't take a week off work and just go off and go sailing, just sailboat racing. They, it's it's a lack of crew um that's 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 driving it and i i think the societal change which is way ahead of the sailing change is a good shift i think the sport needs to respond you're muted you would think after after three years of using zoom I, i'd be good at it but Regardless, thank thank you for that, Wendy. I, I I appreciate that and talk about that that culture shift. Um, that that needs to happen within within all aspects of the sport. So thank you for bringing it up. Um, Isabella or Jen, was there anything else that you'd like to add to that? Yeah, I think uh, I think the scheduling piece, you know, the the whole infrastructure piece. I look at some innovative solutions happening and not for profit in in my community these are in sport and outside of sport and they've got, got uh, systems where uh, parents can come and participate either in an arts event or a sporting event and there's actually child care or there's a kids event happening at the same time so you can just register for both of them and it makes it accessible um scheduling you know um the club that i worked at for years was royal vic we had uh a sister uh, a course called salty sisters we did it on saturday mornings right that's when the women could more often than not be available right and and again it it was coffee and sandwiches there was there was no wine um and it was great or you know if if we are going to have adult or sorry uh women's uh, programming don't have it run by a male coach. I mean, I remember going to the women's keelboat nationals years and years ago, and they put a guy on the back of every boat to coach the women. And I thought, what? Like, what are we doing here? And it was this real culture of, oh, the men are going to come in and show the women how to do it. And it's okay if you're not very good. You know, here's a pink t shirt. And and if you're going to run a women's event, it needs to be authentic. It needs to be high quality. It's not just a participation badge. In fact, if you are running an all women's event, if men want to be there, love it, allies, they can do mark set. They can be support boats. I want to see race officers who are running the races being women. I want to see coaches be women. Like these are like actually carving out those spaces for all aspects of the racing, not just those of us on the boats. 
I, yes, I'd love to have guys there helping to support, but supporting, not taking up the roles that they always have already taken up for years. Awesome. Th thank you. Thank you both for that. Um, just have a couple of questions left. Again, um, keep um, having a great conversation in the chat and any um questions that you may have, feel free to add them in there. Um, in turn, let's look back at um high performance and um competitive. So it doesn't necessarily have to be at the top level, if you will. But um, what steps can be taken to increase representation of women in competitive and high performance levels of sailing to ensure equal opportunities for advancement and recognition? Um, I can just spit out a couple ideas. I think having specific funding, racing is expensive, traveling is expensive. So having funding for women specifically will break down some of those barriers. Um, having, as we already said, all female regattas that are run by women. Like we had a fantastic one at, at a Royal Vancouver Yacht Club last year, last September. It was organized by women, run by women. Um, and, it, and they were all saying, those who were part of that committee who had organized it, said it was actually one of the smoothest regattas they've ever organized. And it was so well done. It was really, really well done. Um, and it was just an incredible event and uh, one I will always remember. So having female only regattas, and now they're going to be running it every year, which is amazing. Um, I think take the tiller day or night so having we had heard this at Robin Cuba Yacht Club that one of the divisions on Wednesday evening said this Wednesday evening two weeks from now every skipper has to be female so for those boats who don't have female skippers go find one and the entire division all agreed and committed to that but can you imagine how amazing it was if every two months every month even that you have only female skippers out of a Wednesday evening, because there are a ton of Wednesday evenings throughout the summer and the spring. I'm sure there could be one or two. And if a boat doesn't have female skippers that they know of, then that encourages them to go find them, that encourages them to reflect or even go look at the youth programs and see if they can bring some girls from there, young female uh, laser sailors, for example, fantastic skippers. You can teach them how to go skip a your keel boat. Maybe they might be a little aggressive on starts, but teach them spatial awareness <laughs> and things like that. So something like take the tail on day um, to encourage specifically more female skippers and then having quotas for women on boats. I mean, um, it's like sail GP does. It's a smaller quota for now, but just having to actually fill that spot um, is somewhere to start. And then as Tina said earlier, having medals, um, the amount of times I would race and there would be maybe 25 lasers, I would come eighth, but I was the only female in the top 10. I got no recognition. Uh, because I didn't come first, second, and third. But I was first female. But it was a local event, so we don't have medals for that. Um, and as Tina said, in the Pumpkin Bowl, which was our local regatta here at West Vancouver Yacht Club, we've started to give out medals for our top female sailors. And I think that makes such a difference. Because all I wanted when I was in that age where I almost quit all those many times was some validation. I never podiumed. And all I wanted to see was just a little bit of validation for the, all the hard work I was putting in up against that many barriers. I just would have loved a medal or two to recognize that, hey, you were the top female sailor. You're the only one in the top 10 right now. That's an amazing feat. So I really, am just, I'm so happy to see that it's starting, but I think we should really normalize and standardize that across all fleets. And it doesn't just have to be at the highest level of racing for that to happen. Because the first time I saw a, a female only medal was at a, a youth national champs in 2018. I hadn't seen it in really any of the local regattas beforehand, but put it at all levels because we all need a bit of external validation every once in a while. And maybe that little medal or trophy is what keeps that girl in sailing for another year or two, or maybe even longer. A lot of clubs now have uh, a women's racing night, and I know at, um, at Port Credit Yacht Club, they've had one going for a very long time. I think they have it in Nepean as well, and I'm sure there are other clubs. My own club, uh, we're starting a series this year, um, and uh, it will be, it, it's actually going to be a beginner's race night, but we're going to have separate starts for uh, a separate start for the women uh, that want to come out and and start racing in a non-threatening environment so that the uh, the usual yellers and aggressive bullies on the start line won't be there. 
Um, so we'll see how it goes, but I, I think it's a start. We're going to have coaching for them. We had a, a town hall. There were only, well, there were, there was a good turnout from our women in the, on the water group. Um, but most of the people in the room were male. And when the question was asked, how many of you would, would come out and help coach the women? Almost every hand in the room went up. Um, one person went so far as to offer his his boat, which is a quite a modern boat. Uh, it's only a couple of years old. So I I think the 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 um, the idea of having maybe once a month. I think it needs to be every week. I think we ha if if we're going to get women back sailing, we need to to start it on a regular basis, not just a a, a regular one. Just my two cents. No, of course. Like um, and I I think that that's absolutely fantastic. Rather than a four week program, if you will, or a, or a six week program, let's um normalize some of the, some of these changes that um we're looking to implement. Um, Jen, I just want to uh, make sure I create space for you to be be able to answer the question or add anything if you like. Yeah, I love the idea of female sponsorship. So the idea that women who have um, stayed in the sport and and risen and, and built their career either as an athlete or a coach or a sport builder have an opportunity to identify and pair with other women and help build them. You know, there is that idea that I've got that precious coveted spot that's for the one token female can we dismantle that? Like it's, it's 2024. We don't need that anymore. Uh, let's build that female network. Uh, let's create those opportunities. Uh, if there's a way to put funding behind that, that's even better. Um, really promoting that idea that the women within the sport can help lift up their successors and have a legacy behind them. I think of the, the women who, uh, I mean, kind of stopped me from quitting sport. One was my coach, Jill Hayward. Uh, she was a 470 sailor. It's basically why I became a 470 sailor. Um, big shout out to Tina who kept me in sport after I had a baby because I thought it was completely inevitable that I would have to leave. And uh, she just told me to pass my baby on to a parent. Never thought of that before. <laughs> so having those people around who've done it who've experienced it, who found solutions, who see pathways when you don't is, is really key. A hundred percent. Thank you for that, Jen. Um, so that's all the questions I have, but I do want to add in um, one bonus question, um, if you will. And um, it goes back to, um, actually it goes back to a comment that um, Kate Easton um, made earlier. And um, she said, it's important to remember that even small actions matter. There isn't a magic solution to sexism. It will be a collection of actions by many people. Every little bit helps. So with that mindset in mind, and um, there's the quote um, from my Angela, do the best you can until you know better. And once you know better, do better. So keep in mind that there were a lot of things um, thrown the participants way and it can be sometimes like drinking out of a fire hose. When we go to begin to create better spaces and places, when we go to create that ripple effect, what is one bit of advice that you can give to folks on the call on how to get started? Or, what, or what's the first thing that you would do to get started, if you will? I think asking the women that you know and act actively listening to what they say and being open to what they say, asking why did you feel like you had to leave or wanted to leave or why, what are you, those barriers? All the questions that we were asked and we just shared asking the women in your life, whether they're in sailing or not, or why are they not? Um, I think that's a great place to start learning from each other. Um, that's, that's the basis of allyship, listening and learning from each other. Um, and I think another great thing that maybe like a structure like Sail Canada could do is connecting all of us because I love hearing about all these different ideas in the chat. And I love learning about programs like Salty Sisters and, you know, what we did in Toronto that I just feel like there are so many separate programs happening across the country that we don't know about. There's no newsletter. 
to learn about this, or at least not one that I'm seeing. So it's hard to know what we could do when we're not seeing those things. And there are just so many great ideas, like just in this alone, like we've generated a bunch of ideas that could be great if even one was implemented at our yacht clubs. And it's hard to come to our yacht club and say, oh, I have all these ideas. Well, what can we do about it? Oh, I can point to this yacht club and exactly what they're doing. Let's model our program after that. So I think if there's a way for us to all consolidate and share our success stories, our great programs um, across the country, then that's such a great way to start because then it feels less daunting to tackle because it is a huge issue. It's so entrenched in our yacht clubs and in our culture. But to hear the success stories about, oh, this club's doing this great program, this club's doing this great program and connecting people across the country, I think that would just be incredible. And we can learn so much from each other and model off each other. We don't all have to like, you know, create the wheel from scratch. That, that that's great i i fully believe not starting from point zero there's, there's always some point to start from it doesn't have to be from scratch so thank you for that isabella um wendy um where should we start where do we need to start well it, it's sort of interesting listening i think we have some of us have different ideas um but i i do think we need to get we need to 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 be respected, and I don't think that happens. I think we really uh, men don't need to earn respect; they get respect right away, and women do not have that same opportunity. I think of a a, a sailor who was uh, quite young; she was in her early twenties. She had soloed across the Atlantic ocean and when she came here and was sailing on a boat uh i won't say what club but she was uh deemed the tweaker girl that's how she was referred to because her role was to adjust the spinnaker tweakers after a jibe and um you know it was completely disrespectful she probably had was was a better sailor than most of the people on the crew, but they didn't trust her to do anything more responsible. Um, and then I, I I had a recent conversation with someone who who as an adult decided to take up laser sailing, and she is going to start to race with us this year. And she said she doesn't like to go out racing with her husband because. He's always giving the orders. He's always telling her what to do. And when she's on her laser, she's out there by herself making her decisions. And as she said, and when I make a mistake, I go swimming. And uh, and you learn from that. And so, but she felt the sense of empowerment just because she was able to be out on her own boat in control of her her own destiny if you will and she 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 really got a sense of empowerment from that so sharing i think i think um isabella's right that sharing these stories helps uh helps build confidence when you know you're not the only one out there that's struggling with it um but those are just a couple of stories but i really think that that until men start respecting what women do and what we've accomplished it's it's an uphill battle thank you for that wendy it it, it, it starts with respect and while it sounds simplistic in nature obviously based on the conversation we were having tonight it, it's it's a bit more complicated than that but thank you for bringing it up and last but certainly not least um jen where where do we need to start where should we start I think we need to start by realizing that sexism comes in many different forms. Uh, what is sexism for someone who's a child, uh, my daughter's age, she's in kindergarten, you know, it comes in the form of when her brother comes up at the end of the day, someone asks him what he did at school. But when my daughter comes up, they say what a pretty dress she has. As teenagers, sexism looks a little bit different. It comes from 
uh, an objectification. It comes from assuming that girls are weaker. They're not as trained. They're not as talented. Uh, when you move into the adult years, uh, sexism comes in the form of women having less economic power. They're not going to own the same equipment. They're not going to uh, have the disposable time, the leisure time. Uh, they have the second shift. They have the mental load, whatever you want to call it. It comes from uh, physical changes uh, as you age and you have kids and your body just isn't the same, right? It, those all impact and manifest in various forms of sexism. As you age, as a woman, I'm, I've seen my mom, my aunts, my mentors uh, feel like they are uh, losing their voice, losing their importance, losing their respect while their male counterparts gain respect they, and gain experience and gain prestige. That impacts every single woman in a different way and it will manifest in how we keep those women in sport, whether it's from an athlete perspective or a coaching perspective or an administrative sport builder or governance perspective. And it's not just one form, it's multiple forms, it's multifaceted and they layer on top of each other. And that, that's, that's perfect. And I, I couldn't leave it any more eloquently than that. So thank you for that, Jen. Um, I know we've talked about it in the um chat a little bit, but um, I know we have some folks on the call from Sale Canada. So I just want to um create space for a few moments um to um share um what what is happening and perhaps some perspectives um from the call. So I'll open. I know there's a few, but I'll open up the floor to any of you from Sale Canada. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, everyone, for um, for uh, for everything tonight. This has been, uh, for me so far, the most inspiring of the IDE seminars. Um, so I want to respond to a couple of the questions. One is sort of, you know, what's Silicon Canada doing in this area to move things forward? Um, we're constantly working. We're applying for funding um, so that we can run seminars like this. Um, as much as Andrew loves us, he's not free, so we have to pay for that. Um, and that's one of the things that that we're able to do because we work to apply for funding so that we can, you know, bring these groups together and and share ideas and share experiences. Um, direct response to Isabella's idea about communication uh, launching on Friday. We have a Canadian women's uh, Facebook a Canadian women's sailing Facebook page that's going to be launched where ideas uh, we're hoping are going to be shared nationally, even internationally with um, Canadian uh, women or um, those involved with, with sailing who are interested in this type of area. So we're looking forward to, to launching that. Um, I shared a link in our chat and it's on the same page of our website that um, you went to to register for tonight, which is our um, Sail Canada IDE action plan. Um, the plan sort of divided. We, we developed it with Inclusion Inc. It's divided into four uh, pillars, we call them, um, that sort of um, robustly cover all areas of IDE within our sport and, and governance models. And um, if you go there and take a look at our strategic, uh, sorry, not our strategic plan, but our IDE strategy, um, which is just one or two clicks down farther on the page, you'll be able to see where we've identified areas that we need to work towards um, all areas of IDE, including gender equity. So um, I encourage you to, to go there, give it a read, um, and then send me an email if you have any questions. Um, I, I think that's all that I have to share. I, we've got Jen, Sam, and Kim on the call as well, who are um, uh, in the office with me every day if they want to add anything. Sorry to put you guys on the spot. I know it's always typically me that does the speaking from the staff perspective here, but I just felt it's fun to share the share the load once in a while.
That's totally okay too, because if it would Nick put you on the spot. But um with that said, um, we're basically to the end. I, I know we we've gone over time a bit, but um to Nick's point, it's amazing how great a um webinar can be when I do very little talking. So in 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 all sincerity, um thank you very much to um Wendy, Jen, and um Isabella for um sharing your experiences and um taking the time um, not only to chat um with the folks on um tonight's call, but also um with myself and a little bit of pre-work um that we've done. Um I'm not um going away just yet. We have one more um session coming up on um Tuesday, March 26th at um 7 p.m. Um, to talk about um, anti-racism. And that will be the um, last in um, this series for, for now. You know, it is definitely a future, but for now, that's the last of this mm -hmm. series. Um, again, um, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for joining us. And I hope you all have a great evening. Thanks, Sandra. Thank you. Uh, Jen's just uh, texting me right now. She was trying to say something, but I don't think her um, internet connection is um, allowing for it. So unfortunately, we won't be able to hear from them. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Sorry, I was having an unstable um, connection issue. I just wanted to thank everyone uh, for attending and being a part of this conversation. This is where we start to make change. Um, so thank you all for your time, for our panelists, Andrew, for your um, for your assistance in helping guide us. Um, and as Nick mentioned, we have um, we have a number of initiatives that we are that we're working towards to to address the issues that face us, um, including gender equity. So thank you all. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Andrew. Thanks for another great um, another great seminar. We'll see you again in uh, two weeks for the racism seminar. Sounds great. We'll see you then.